Okay, and next up we have Dwayne Gill. He's from OSU, as you can tell by his shirt bling that he's wearing. <laughs> right there, he's traveling down from uh, Oklahoma for us to talk about some of his research and his colleagues' research, looking at um, the impacts of uh, oil spills on social disruption. Great, thank you for having me here. Uh, my colleague, partner, and spouse, Lisa Ritchie, she usually gives a speech, so uh, I'm filling in for her. Uh, she's over in the UK right now doing some uh, research advising on uh, hydraulic fracturing and so forth. So, um, what I want to start with is kind of situating oil spill research into a larger body of research particularly research oriented toward disasters. And disaster research has been around for almost 100 years. One of the first uh, big scientific studies of uh, a disaster was happened in uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia after a munition ship exploded and created lots of havoc in the community, lots of responses. A sociologist by the name of Prince, studied this, documented some of the reactions, and actually uh, wrote his uh, PhD dissertation on that. So we have over 100 years of scientific social science research on disasters. So when we talk about oil spills, you know, we can kind of situate this in a larger body of literature. I want to focus a little bit on psychosocial. And for those of you who are not really uh, attuned to the social science part of it, I don't know how to translate this into common English, but we're basically looking at the interrelationship between uh, social factors and individual behaviors. So the basic idea is that you really can't separate an individual behavior away from the social context in which it occurs. And we're particularly interested when we're talking about disasters, about what happens to disrupt this interrelationship between individuals and their social context. And what a lot of what disasters are about is this disruption that occurs. So what kinds of things uh, create this disruption? Well, uh, a lot of it that we've talked about and focused on in terms of research has to do with natural disasters, but we also know that there are technological disasters and more recently become really aware of premeditated, purposeful acts of terrorism, mass shootings, and so forth. So in looking at this kind of continuum of deliberateness, uh, there's really not a whole lot that we can do to prevent a natural hazard event from occurring. Now we can prepare for some of the potential impacts of that event, but we really can't control whether a natural hazard event is going to occur or not. Uh, technological disasters, we kind of presume that, hey, we've got control over the technology and then something goes awry and we've lost control. Therefore, there's someone to blame. Natural hazard events, not a whole lot of people or entities to blame. Technological disasters, there's a primary responsible party that can be identified and held accountable. Same thing when the purposeful premeditated acts, you've got people identified. And these kinds of disruptions, when you can identify an entity or uh, an individual who's the culprit, you experience greater disruption, more anger, uh, more outrage because someone didn't do their job properly. There's been a series of technological disaster events that have really begun to make these kinds of distinctions between natural disasters and technological disasters. Again, kind of a continuum. They're not necessarily separate entities. But we can go back to uh, some of the early studies after the Buffalo Creek flood. The old Buffalo Creek flood, isn't that a natural disaster or natural hazard? Actually, it was caused by a poorly constructed dam that didn't really have adequate engineering, didn't have adequate inspection of it. So the dam failed and uh, wiped out about 125 people and 17 communities down this. Area. This is back in the early 70s. Kai Erickson is uh, well known for his scientific work in this disaster. I'm sure you've all heard of Love Canal. Uh, here's a situation where a community was built on a hazardous waste site, uh, built a school, and then 
strange diseases and other kinds of things began to occur. And over a long course of time, uh, eventually the community housing was uh, bought out, uh, but we still have problems with Bluff Canal, believe it or not, even though it happened in 1978. Dumont Island, Pennsylvania is another kind of common, well-recognized technological disaster. Uh, one of the interesting things here is just the amount of unknowns at the time. Uh, what's the exposure? Who should leave? Who shouldn't leave? All this confusion really contributed a lot more to the mental health issues than perhaps the radiation itself. You know, so kind of this misinformation or lack of information, uh, continuing uncertainty is one of the hallmarks of this kind of disaster. So some of the things that we've learned by studying events like Three Mile Island, Love Canal, so on and so forth, is this pervasive uncertainty which exists in communities experiencing these kinds of disasters. Uh, we don't know the extent of exposure. We don't know uh, what the effects of exposure might be. We don't know how it's affecting the environment or interactions with the environment. Lots of contested interpretations of the event. You know, the fish are safe to eat? No, they're not. Air is safe to breathe? No, it's not. And so lots of contestation about what these problems are, what we should be responding to, how should we be reacting. Again, one of the things I mentioned, uh, the technology is you lose control. Again, this creates more outrage, more anger. You've got the primary responsible parties to identify, help be held accountable. And there, Response processes are, are different. If you think of uh, the previous example, Hurricane Katrina, your house is ripped up and so forth, there's something you can do about that. Responses to oil spills and other chemical spills, and you're dealing with some very technical uh, responses. How do you clean up that oil? How do you contain it? How do you remediate? These are things that you don't really see a lot of in most natural hazard events. Some other things that we know, there's social vulnerability to uh, the environmental hazards, particularly if you're in a community that uh, relies on environmental resources that have been damaged or that are threatened. Uh, there's disruption in interpersonal groups and relationships. Uh, one of the things that we find in technological disasters is something we call the corrosive community. So this multiple definitions of the situation, contestation about what's going on, uncertainty, oftentimes factionalizes groups in, in the impacted community. They disagree about what's happening, what should be done, so you get lots of disruptions in interpersonal relationships. Uh, individual and community ties to relationship uh, to the environment, again, is something which is important. Most technological disasters uh, have a severe disruption of this relationship. And then we have invisible trauma. Uh, most chemicals, uh, it's kind of invisible. You can't taste them, you can't smell them, you can't touch them. Radiation is a really good example of the invisible trauma. If you don't have a Geiger counter, you don't even know it. But so these are some of the things that we found secondary trauma from uh, bureaucratic processes trying to get compensation oftentimes goes into litigation which is even more of a bureaucratic nightmare you've got long-term adverse health effects both physical and mental oftentimes in technological disasters you lack closure okay, if hurricane katrina you got your house rebuilt other people got their houses rebuilt got your community going back kind of return to normal Oftentimes in technological disasters, there's no normal to return to. People in Love Canal have not returned to any kind of normal. Uh, so you, you lack that closure. Recovery becomes elusive. How do you know when you've recovered? Natural disasters, you got a little bit better indicators. Technological disasters, is the environment clean? Uh, we don't know. And oftentimes it comes into an idea of reluctant resignation. We've done all we can, there's really nothing more we can do. We just have to resign ourselves that we're living in this situation. It's kind of depressing. So when we look at social impacts of marine oil spills, 
we can kind of follow the same kind of body of knowledge that we learn from other technological disasters and other natural hazard events. And particularly uh, looking at social disruption after these events, uh, research on the Exxon Valdez oil spill, the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill, is increase our understanding of these particular types of technological disasters. So we got the Exxon Valdez in 89, Deepwater Horizon, uh, 2010. So here are some of the key findings, at least from some of our research on uh, the uh, psychosocial impacts of the Deepwater Horizon. Uh, early studies showed heightened uh, levels of stress, social cultural disruption, um, harmful mental health effects, behavioral responses, uh, strong relationship between elevated anxiety, stress, and depression, and concerns about the environment and economic impacts. The individuals concerned about uh, their levels of community attachment, uh, experience increased stress. Uh, contrary to what Catherine was saying, some of the things that we found with Exxon Valdez is that these strong community attachments didn't necessarily buffer stress in the long term. Uh, because uh, most of the people in our community were fishermen, fishers. So they didn't have non-fishers support groups to kind of pull them out. You know, they're all in the same situation. They're all kind of suffering. Uh, so those social networks kind of contribute to uh, long-term chronic stress. Some other findings, we did some comparisons with uh, some studies we did in Exxon Valdez in Cordova in 89, and did some work in uh, uh, South Mobile County, South Baldwin County. We saw some very similar types of patterns in terms of uh, social responses to these two different events. Lots of uh, concern about health and economic futures. That's predicting a lot of stress, psychosocial stress. We had a lot of economic loss. I mean, that makes sense. We're going to have stress if we've got economic problems. Connections to re renewable resources that were threatened or damaged is another uh, factor that is uh, more likely to increase stress. Of course, if you're exposed to the oil in lots of different ways. And involvement in compensation processes also contributes to stress, particularly some of the long-term stress that we find in these types of events. Um, particularly in terms of some of the compensation, being claimant can be very stressful because you're interacting again with these impersonal bureaucracies, you're having to trust lawyers, and uh, that's, that's a lot of trust to put out there if you're trusting lawyers, right? Uh, and even if you're not involved in the compensation process, you can still be disrupted by others being involved in it. A really good example in Cordova, uh, Alaska, at the Exxon Valdez, is about a quarter of the households, maybe as many as one third of the households in Cordova, had a member who was involved in the litigation. Okay, so you really couldn't escape the litigation, even if you weren't actively involved in it yourself. Because this kind of highlights this chronic nature of technological disasters. And that again, it's a process, the social process. Uh, this is a uh, diagram that uh, I guess it's available out there. You might probably have it on your table in front of you. But it kind of situates some of the uh, psychological and sociological effects intermediated by the health, economic concerns, broader cultural effects. This uh, Diagrams come out of uh, a lot of our work, uh, a lot of scientific work on social impacts and psychological impacts of oil spills. Okay, so we've got all this information. How should we begin to think about it or what should we be considering coming out of all this information? <clears throat> well, one thing that we know is that uh, our uh, years of research on uh, impacts of oil spills and other disasters has led to some good programs. Uh, we've talked about uh, the Care Listener Program, 
This is something that was developed out of our work on the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Steve Piku was the leader in that. Uh, it's also impact, it impacted how we go about assessing uh, impact, social impacts of future oil and gas development. Lisa and I have been doing some work with First Nations up in Canada who are experiencing uh, oil and gas development and some of the negative adverse impacts on them as individuals, communities, and their traditional culture. Uh, in terms of looking how we're going to move forward, um, I think really increasing our understanding about uh, the mitigation, preparedness, uh, response, compensation processes. Uh, we need to really better understand that. And I think uh, we really need to focus a lot more on preparedness, preparedness, and preparedness. Uh, and then we need to focus on preparedness as well. <laughs> we have to be prepared. Because if we're not prepared, we shouldn't be surprised when the adverse impacts explode in our face. Uh, so, oh yeah, focus on preparedness, awareness. <laughs> um, you know, we have to understand the risk and communicate it at the local level. So one of the things that we were talking about in our group one session is how do we communicate effectively, and particularly when there are groups who don't speak English. And even groups who do speak English don't understand scientific lingo. So how do we be more effective in our communication? Um, emphasizing local knowledge. The locals know a lot of stuff. Now, yes, sometimes it's not as accurate as the scientific method might wish it to be, but it doesn't mean that we should ignore it. Uh, we should also actively seek civic engagement. The communities need to be engaged in the planning and preparedness process should be something that's forced down upon them. It should be kind of a groundswell up. Uh, we should include oil spill research and broad-based community resilience efforts. Talking at noon, someone's talking about resilience in hurricanes. Well, what are you doing for oil spills? It should be integrated. When we talk about resilience, it's a whole community, lots of different hazards, and begin to build consensus. Thank you. Yes, you